Hello, good evening everybody. We are so excited. Welcome to our spring lecture series. This is the second lecture of our series. We are completely honored and delighted to have Kenneth Frampton joining us this evening. I will pass off the mic to my colleague, Professor Michael Schwarting, who will introduce him. And we would like to have a warm round of applause for M Michael. Yes, good evening. And uh, I don't think I've ever seen it quite this full. So this is wonderful. Um, I'm very privileged to be able to do this introduction of Kenneth Frampton tonight. Uh, the paper that you got uh, has a few short paragraphs, but uh, Kenneth's resume would probably be a book in itself. Um, and uh, uh, his resume is very packed. Um, and it's not so easy to unpack it. So some highlights um, that I think are important to us, and I would say related to uh, 40th Street and 116th Street on the west side, somewhere between the ends of uh, the NYIT being in the middle. Uh, we had uh, the well-known British invasion in the 60s. The Beatles, films, fashion, remember Twiggy, uh, and yes, architects. Uh, a gang, including Kenneth, uh, that brought lots of information and ideas that we were missing and in uh, somewhat primitive, maybe sobel, uh, noble savage existence, uh, awareness in, in the U.S. Although an ar architect before uh, Kenneth arrived, uh, he positioned himself as a teacher and a writer of design, important design and history, and as a critic, great uh, English attributes. Uh, many here tonight have been students of Kenneth's or worked uh, as colleagues of Kenneth's, uh, from Jonathan Friedman back in Princeton to Nader Vesugian at Columbia. And I thought maybe just uh, uh, maybe show a hands of how many people studied and, and worked with Kenneth out of curiosity. OK, it's, con it's considerable. Um, so two things to highlight amongst so many. Uh, in the late 60s, down on 40th Street, Kenneth was behind Peter Eisenman's Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies, the IAUS, or what we used to call the TOOT. Um, he co-founded uh, the journal Oppositions, a very critical journal, it had 26 issues from 1973 to 1984. Those are surprised uh, collection of, of very important um, uh, documents. And all of this was very important, this period of time of the Institute, to creating a New York architectural culture and putting the city on a kind of important global map. In 1972, lured from Princeton, uh, perhaps you wanted to leave Princeton, I'm not sure, um, Kenneth uh, was asked by the new dean, James Polshek, to form a curriculum. Kenneth didn't write a mission or make a strategic plan, but he wrote a catalog. He fixed the courses, and he collected some important people to work together. This put Columbia on the map as a school, and I would say school with a kind of capital S, um, after nearly collapsing in the, the hiatus of the 60s. Although I said he was behind um, uh, what happened at the Toot and at Columbia, it would be uh, more appropriate, and I think Kenneth would be happier if I said he was in front or led as a kind of avant-garde position in these places. This has resulted in two critical con uh, con contributions that should also be highlighted. One, a kind of forever pursuing the relationship between form and tectonics, a word that uh, Kenneth has uh, brought us to uh, use over and over again. I keep thinking it could be a, a sort of British architectural drink, uh, gin and tectonics. Uh, but it's, uh, I think, an issue that we uh, struggle with to get it right still in our pedagogies. And also the second thing, that he brought politics, the discussion of ideology, into the discourse of architecture. For a time, we in fact loved the Russians, at least the suprematists and the constructivists and even the Marxists. 
Uh, this was quite absent in the U.S., and uh, we only have to think of uh, uh, Philip Johnson's international style to see where we've come from. Um, I believe he shares an important kin kinship with uh, Jürgen Abermas's belief in the modernist project, which Kenneth brought to architecture and to us b even before Abermas. All of us admire him for who he is and for what he has given to us. And so I'd like to welcome Kenneth to our school. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming. I, I, I've said once or twice this evening already that I think, um, I, I think it's a very nice sort of, it's hard to talk about these things, but I, I just think it's a very nice spirit in this place and uh, I, you know, compounded, I'm sure, of many somewhat intangible things. And I've been here before, of course, but I've never, never been in this lecture hall, so pretty astonished by this. The, the comfort and the intimacy of this space. Am I, am I talking? Is it all right? Can you hear me? I hope. And, uh, <clears throat> and I realize I don't have that much time. I mean, I'm told I should carry on for about an hour, and then um, my colleague uh, Nada Vasuhian will uh, engage with me for a while, and um, yes, um, I think administer the right amount of suspicion, etc., as to what I've been trying to pursue in the time I have at my disposal. And of course, you already know this is the cover of the book, which some of you have been kind enough to purchase, and which. Um, I must say, I'm, I, I didn't realize it was 25 bucks because I think it's actually a relatively inexpensive book, as a matter of fact, by uh, today's standards, which uh, astonishes me because um, actually last night my colleague Mary McLeod was complaining about the price of architectural books. So this is the cover of this thing. Actually, I never, it's very funny. I, I was very involved in the design. It's Lars Muller, of course, and Lars. Uh, got very impatient with me in particular because, uh, of course, we never, we were late, uh, or, you know, no, no, uh, delinquent. And uh, we had a, um, yes, we had a kind of disagreement about the cover. Well, I, I had a more elaborate cover. I think he has the right cover. It, anyway, it's as good as any other. I'm not entirely sure about the color, but who, what can I say? Anyway, um, why don't I get down to the topic and uh, stop um, digressing about graphics. And, oh, this brings me to Lars again, of course, because he said, I mean, okay, I'll try and keep it as simple as possible. I mean, uh, in fact, I think Michael might have experienced this, but um, in any case, you know, I, I came to the States first in 65. I started to teach in Princeton, which was a very... Uh, actually very, already of course a very prosperous place, not quite as prosperous as it is now. <laughs> and, uh, but it had a rather new school of architecture and it had a new dean soon after I arrived, Robert Geddes from Philadelphia. And it had the, these young Turks, and then I should also say because one of these young Turks that's not so young anymore will be the last lecturer, lecturer in this lecture series in the school, which of course is the illustrious Peter Eisenman, without whom, you know, there would have been no Institute for Architecture and Open Studies, without a doubt, without his charismatic uh, genius for what he called souffle making, I think it wouldn't have happened, and uh, I'm sure it wouldn't have happened, and, and everything that happened in that place was very much to do with his, um, yeah, well, it's a kind of genius, really. And, um, so it's a touching fact that here I am, the second lecturer, and he is the last. And, and, but anyway, he is responsible for inviting me to uh, Princeton in the first place, and it kind of changed my, you know, changed the trajectory of my life, I think. Because I hadn't had the idea that, I mean, I was trained as an architect. I, I, uh, I, I thought I, would, I was coming to the States on a visit. I didn't have any idea that I would end up staying here, basically. And uh, 
with all the privileges that were sort of, um, what can I say, made available to me, uh, particularly in Princeton <coughs> with, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's another period of, of history altogether because that place then was rather naive and uh, very generous. And of course it was uh, maybe a particular generous moment in the history of the United States as well. Anyway, uh, at some point I got, I was, became a member of the faculty there and I, was the, I had the naive take, talking about naive places and naive people, to accept to teach a, co a course which had the title Values, Concepts and Methods. This was a course invented by Bernard Spring who had come from MIT and who was the right hand of Robert Geddes Dean, was in fact associate dean. And so, you know, somehow or other, I agreed to give this course. And I gave it for um, a semester and then I realized, you know, I was all out of, what can we say, you know, uh, quality reading for architectural students and for myself, in fact, you know, not that, I mean, it's my own limitations. And so I had one more semester to go with this crazy title, Values, Concepts and Methods, and they decided to ask the students to analyze buildings, existing buildings. Well, really, projects also. And um, then I realized something, which is that, you know, in a way, if you analyze a single thing, you, uh, you, it's a kind of, you, you learn more and more about it, but it, it is its own, it confirms itself in a way. There's no dynamic. I think, built into the procedure. And then I thought, well, if you compare uh, two works answering the same programmatic brief, then coming from different ideological standpoints, then the question of what is similar and what is different would be highlighted by comparing them under certain categories. So that's uh, the beginning of this whole thing. And I think I've digressed already because I was going to explain this title, A Genealogy of Modern Architecture, because the course I gave, which starts then probably, uh, I don't really know exactly the first time, to tell you the truth, but somewhere around 69, I think, I started to give this course and, and I would give it in Princeton, but then later in Columbia and also later in the Royal College of Art in London. And it you know, became my, my party piece. My party trick, basically, and uh, and uh, um, and the title of it was comparative critical analysis of built form. And Lars said, "Well, you can never sell a book with a title like that." So he came up with this idea of a genealogy of modern architecture, and I quite like that title. But then it trapped me in trying to justify the title, and there's a lot of blurb at the beginning of this book, which is really an attempt to justify the title. And part of the blurb in part one is to the synoptic history of the modern movement. And there the dates are quite important. It's 23 to 1980. And actually, well, 23 because uh, basically the, 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 one of the key buildings that's, that starts, that always started the course, which was the Rietfeld Schroeder House in Utrecht, is more or less finished by 1923. 923 is also the year of the Van Dersberg van Eastern uh, exhibition of neoplastic architecture in Paris. It, it, two, two things sort of coincide. And 1980 is actually the, the year that I published the uh, book Modern Architecture Critical History, which it always surprises me is also the year of the first Biennale in Venice, uh, curated by Paolo Portuguese. Uh, with the, with the, with the slogan, the, the end of prohibition and the presence of the past, which really opens to a kind of postmodern style in a big way. And uh, um, but so the date 1980 is also the one year after the English translation of Jean Francois Louis Lyotard's The Postmodern Condition, and I think that you know compared to the um, modern project as it was between the end of the First World War and the beginning of the Second World War. Uh, after the war, the modern project was by no means the same, uh, for obvious reasons. Above all, of course, Auschwitz on the one hand and Hiroshima on the other, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I mean, with these two things, particularly the nuclear, uh, yes, use of nuclear weapons in this fashion, 
you know, the idea of progress in the 19th century sense was no longer, could no longer be believed in in the same way. And I think that's what is the huge difference between the modern project before the Second World War and the modern project after the Second World War. And um, so, you know, uh, uh, well, I think there is, of course, there is a reconstruction of Europe after the Second World War, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the philosophical argument that uh, there is no more grand narratives, which is basically the argument of Lyotard in the postmodern condition, is, is kind of, you know, in a sort of philosophical sense, um, you know, sort of decisive. And I think apart from the question of postmodern style, uh, you know, I think this condition of a kind of post condition is unavoidable. But, and the but is that um, I still, and I still have this kind of scar left on the mind that the, that the modern project in the Habermas sense the unfinished modern project is still uh, an aspiration, and that the um, and that the legacy of the heroic modern movement between the end of the First World War and the beginning of the Second is is still uh, an extremely rich legacy uh, that can that is part of our tradition, and and then I would say uh, the tradition of the new, you know. And, I, and I'm someone who is sort of more or less convinced after Zygmunt Bauman that, you know, you, the, the relationship between innovation and tradition is, uh, you know, symbi symbiotically unavoidable and that you can't really have a tradition that can be considered a living tradition without innovation and you can't really have innovation without a vital tradition. I, I, you know, in cultural terms anyway, of course, it... it um, doesn't well. It's a whole other issue for the for the for the dominant uh, ethos of techno science. But um, anyway, obviously, it's a long conversation which can't possibly be dealt with uh, in the sp in the space of an hour, let alone uh, anyway. And so I indulge in this whole like these two artistic emblems, one of which is on the cover of the book, and the other one is this uh, a, a schema of a purist painting by Le Corbusier, circa 1920. This marriage de contour, which you see in the image, the, this image, of course, as opposed to that, that these um, uh, two things are, are, are lying there behind the legacy of the, of the modern movement and the tradition. And actually, this extraordinary map, which I will show again, which he, he, he being Le Corbusier, publishes in 1925, which is a map of Europe where it's coded in three uh, code letters. One is I, which stands for industry. One is F, which stands for folklore. And one is C, that stands for culture. But I've always interpreted it to mean culture in the sense of classic, although he does not say that. It has the word, simply the word culture. And um, uh, in different parts of Europe, you know, there are different densities of the I, C, and F, you know, as, which is his retrospective view of what was the state of affairs in Europe in 1912 when he took his famous voyage d'Orient, of which there is a map. Okay, and if we jump now, because I have no choice in the space of an hour, but to jump, to 1927 and to this uh, famous axo of Le Corbusier's uh, competition entry for the Société des Nations, um, this amazing axonometric, and then uh, the fact that um, it is very different from this axonometric, although it's, of course, Hans Meyer, Hans Bitter entry for the same competition. And uh, this second image, and there are other images that are a little different, but well, what's, of course, very striking is the fact that Meyer and Witwer do not show the landscape at all, and the, um, and look up, look up, Buzier, why isn't it going, oh, there we are, okay, does, of course. The building is, you know, inextricably uh, um, layered into the landscape, and uh, in, the, in the Meyer case, of, you know, there is no landscape, and uh, there's no uh, axo by Meyer, Maya Witwer, where the landscape is shown, in fact. And, uh, 
And so, you know, I didn't know anything about this until, and I now forget the date, Claude Schneid, Swiss uh, German architect, who uh, publishes a book, Hannes Meyer uh, Buildings Projects Writings. I think it must be, I don't know, 86, 87. Anyway, uh, you know, that gives me the material of the other, uh, well, there's one other interesting entry by Neutra and Schindler, but you know, if you compare these two, Anyway, for me, you know, in 88, I write this thing, Humanist versus Utilitarian Ideal, that's what it was called, appeared in magazine AD. And in a way, it's, it's like crystallizes for me. I mean, I've been, and that's what's odd, you know, I can't really figure it all out, that I'd been doing um, this analysis thing before, but somehow, the, the, anyway, these two entries for this competition kind of heighten the, the interest in comparing uh, the solutions, two different uh, projects for, to answer the same program. And, and, you know, you can, of course, you can go on and on about this, this comparison, but maybe the most telling thing, I think, is that the, that this is all modular, you know, sorry, uh, I need, right, this. I mean, no, one more. You know, it, it's all quite obviously modular. The whole damn thing is on the same module. And moreover, this module could be added to and taken away from. In fact, you know, in, in essence, it's the system of the Crystal Palace of 1851, you know. Uh, I mean, he's not copying the Crystal Palace, but it is that idea of a, of a repeated reproductive module that can, from which everything can be made. And, um, well, I, I, this, uh, I can't get into this, but this is also changes in his career that... Uh, but let me go back just a minute to... because I obviously didn't quite finish this issue. Is that if you... and it's, it's too boring to go into, but if you compare uh, this auditorium to... Um, this auditorium, the, and if you think, well, well, you not only think, I mean, it's interesting because Le Corbusier calls it Palais de Nation, Palace of the Nations, and Meyer insists a uh, building for the League of Nations, you know. Uh, Meyer insists on the word building and not on, and re repudiates the idea of architecture, basically. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, ultra-materialist position. But when you compare the two auditoria, the more rational of the two auditoria, from the point of view of the coherence of the structure and the acoustics, is probably the Corbusier auditoria and not the Hannes Meyer. And I can't fully demonstrate that, but you can imagine that the, that the angled girders that support this egg, you know, totally collide with the orthogonal gridded structure that surrounds it. Uh, amongst other irrationalities. And you can see from the drawing, and I don't have the drawing here, you know, that is so obviously a, a unresolved uh, condition. So there's a paradox that um, when you compare those two buildings, that, um, that, that what, what is ostensibly, ideologically, materialist, industrialized, prefabricated, modular, it has in it, and that's not the only, uh, you know, certain kind of incoherence because of the obsession of production and uh, serialized production. You know, I mean, of course, it it doesn't necessarily follow, but in this particular case, that's the strange contrast between them. And um, so then I, I, you know, I, I, okay. The next thing I have to sort of warn you about is I, you know, well. Okay, the whole idea of type as a point of departure was very prevalent in the 60s, partly coming through Italian uh, thing. And, and uh, type in this sense, you know, uh, in the sense of this is from Durand, it's a hypothetical rationalized type. Also, by the way, a predilect you can see there's a predilection in that type for modularity. and. Uh, and so, one of the things under which, you know, I asked the students to uh, look at two buildings, compare them as types, and type in relation to the context in which the building is situated. 
And here, you know, some more reflections on type, such as this 1948 Rudolf Wittko, uh, Wittko's Architectural Principles in the Age of Humanism, uh, which, uh, where, you know, where the idea of type is uh, not the only moment, but the idea of type in the uh, Catrimet de Concy 19th century sense of type is, is returned to by this German historian. And I, I'm opposing it here to, you know, a continuity of type in the sense of biological type as it appears in Darcy Thompson's growth and form, you know, comparing somehow organic type and, uh, and uh, you know, architectural type. And then this issue arises, public, semi-public, private, and service. Because, um, yeah, OK. So uh, then I have uh, no choice but to, amend, to enter into a book from which I will never recover, which is Hannah Arendt's book, The Human Condition of uh, 58, that um, in which she coins the term, well, she, first of all, there are so many things in that book, but um, <clears throat> One thing is her, her distinction between work and labor, work as um, that state of affairs in which that which, which is produced is not intended for consumption. And, and uh, labor as that state of affairs, the opposite in fact, where the thing produced is intended for consumption. And where the one, the work is to do with stasis and durability of the, ma of the artificial world made by human species and, and the other being uh, um, fungible, um, um, uh, never finished in a sense. And actually in another essay, and I don't want to get into it now, I make this distinction between architecture and building, where architecture is, is surely a noun, and building is a gerund, you know, which is a verb noun, and implies already process in the word itself as opposed to architecture. You know. But anyway, she really, uh, I mean, I, it, well, I just think that that book contains insights which I, you know, speaking for myself, I, I will never kind of ever get over. And, uh, and one of the terms she uses, which is this term space of public appearance, which could be said of this space, for example, for sure, you know, is this honorific space where the body politic, the society gathers, you know, and therefore this distinction between public and private. I mean, she... Um, this idea that the private, of course, is about intimacy and the public is about, um, you know, collective uh, being. And, and uh, so those two, t those two opposites I engage with. And then, of course, this impossible, like, um, in-between semi-public. And then finally, the fourth category, service. I mean, which I, which I, well, I told students, and I kind of believe it, I suppose, that are those spaces... In, in a building, which are spaces that, you know, basically you will not either enter or remain in for a very long time. So, I mean, one kind of classic, uh, you know, not classic, but one example which might clarify this is, you know, the average uh, bathroom as hygiene box is something one enters and usually doesn't hang around. And, uh, and you know, that's it. It's, 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 it's a functional space of rather minimum dimensions designed for that purpose. And uh, as opposed to, let's say, uh, in a rather rich house in California, a, roo a room which has a jacuzzi and is opens to an outside terrace, then it becomes more pro problematic. I mean, what kind of, that's also could be called loosely the bathroom, but obviously it isn't a service space in the same, spence, same sense as the average minimum bathroom. And then there follows a whole you know, storage, of course, Elevate, uh, escape stairs, elevator shafts, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are private, and uh, so that then that that's the way the whole game is set up, and um, and then there is this business of the passage through the spatial sequence, and this idea of root and goal, you know, and of course here is the Villa Savoir, and I suppose it personifies the Le Corbusier notion of a promenade architecturale, you know, the the idea of the root goal condition. And actually, I just read, um, I, I was I recently encountered a book uh, which actually is written by an Iranian living in Berlin. 
and uh, on phenomenology, actually. Uh, I think it's called an articulated phenomenological interpretation of architecture. It's, it's an extraordinary work. And, uh, but in that work, he takes me to task for not really um, adequately pursuing you know, the, the movement of the body being through the space. But I, I don't really think that this proves that I, doesn't prove the issue one way or another, but, you know, um, it's part of this story. And then, well, uh, yes, maybe I have to go back, right. So I don't quite know what I've done with it. Where is it? Oh, yes. It's, it's this thing, structure membrane. Because I, I, the other thing, I think, is that um, you know, the question of the structure and, and the question of whether it's expressed or suppressed, or the degrees to which it is uh, expressed, suppressed, or both, you know, is, is, an, interesting, it, 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 you know, an interesting kind of aspect of um, the whole thing. And then, uh, too fast. And then this question of details, and that's why I, I try to make the argument, you know, that the details uh, connote uh, values which are uh, latent or even overtly present in the work, or the two works being compared in a different way. And um, so that's the categories, you know, and uh, yes, so. The, the, and so I always began the course with these same two buildings, which is the Rietveld Schroeder House, 23-24, uh, uh, designed and built by a cabinet maker, Herrit Rietveld in Utrecht. It's still there, of course. It's a classic uh, piece, been restored. It's a museum house, of course, by now. And um, it embodies this kind of neoplastic pinwheel idea uh, um, very much influenced by um, Dutch neoplastic painting, above all by um, Mondrian, of course, who publishes in 1917 Neoplasticism in Painting, and has an enormous influence on uh, others, including Bart van der Leck and uh, Thier van Dersberg. <coughs> and uh, and the, the De Steyl movement, otherwise neoplastic movement, is started <coughs> Um, as the war is ending, as the First World War is ending in 1918, and the manifesto that they publish sets up this opposition between individual and the universal, and, and the aesthetic that is developed by uh, Mondrian and also by Rietveld is, uh, um, and by van Dersberg van Eastern, when one tries to turn the aesthetic into the built, uh, into a three-dimensional architectural work and uh, and set against this work which is the 1926 Maison Cook Le Corbusier Pierre Genere in Bois de Boulogne in Paris and what's fascinating is that the two works also have manifestos that accompany them so that the Rietveld house and I don't think Rietveld in you know sort of yeah I don't know how conscious how consciously this was all processed by Rietveld. But in any case, van Dersberg, who's the kind of talking head painter, you know, leader of the movement, publishes this 16 points of a plastic architecture. And, um, and Le Corbusier publishes his five points of a new architecture in 1926. They are, you know, piloti, free plan, free facade, uh, fenêtre en longueur, and roof garden. You know, they, and, um, well, I, I can't go through all these um, more elaborate 16 points of van Dersberg, but um, I mean, the, the, the difference, I think, between the two works is very patent uh, uh, in that, well, and also historically, certain things are like, this is before, one year before, the Maison Cook is one year before the Le Corbusier project for the Palais de la in Geneva. And uh, the long window, which is one of the points, sorry, 
this thing, which, uh, what do I have? Free facade, free plan, uh, piloti, furniture on the roof garden. Actually, he had at some point, when he first publishes it, a sixth point. And the sixth point was elimination of the cornice. And, and then he dropped it because, of course, he wanted to set up the six points as though they were a kind of quasi-scientific uh, uh, declaration of a new architecture. And if he had kept, him, you know, the elimination of the cornice was a giveaway, because it's a giveaway in the sense that there's a sort of latent classicism here somewhere or other, and we better keep that quiet. So he cuts out the sixth point and, uh, and publishes only five. And, um, and so, uh, so these are you know, two works that are ostensibly answering the same program, which is the design of a middle class house. And, um, and so you see, it, this Riedpout Schroeder house isn't quite pure mm. because it, it ought to have been a kind of uh, centrifugal work, but it's stuck on the end of a pre-existing brick terrace. So it has three sides which are actively pinwheeling but the fourth is kind of buried, as you can see, and it looked out. And so one's comparing site plan for site plan here, you know. He looked out over the, what was once open countryside and will uh, be eclipsed by an auto route quite early on. And uh, whereas this one is, in a, is wedged in a terrace, there's an automobile axis, which there is not in the Rietfeld Schroeder house, there's a garage in there built for American couple, by the way. Different class, really, because the Riefer Schroeder house was built for an eccentric, uh, progressive Dutch woman who was into well, all sorts of progressive I ideals and, uh, and, in fact, was a lover of Riefer. Riefer sets himself up in the house. He has even a little studio in the house. Whereas this is built for a, a relatively straight, um, middle-class expatriate Americans, you know, who have, I think it's the, the wife is a painter, I think. And uh, so they have, anyway, they end up with this house with its pilote, you know, reinforced concrete frame construction, unlike the other one, which is a, you'd never know it, but you know, it, it's all timber frame. And all this kind of plaster over stuff is, uh, is kind of fake, you know, abstract bits and pieces. I mean, it's an extraordinary um, technical game in as much as these very large windows designed by the master cabinet makers swing out, you know, and, and blow open the, the corner of the building. And, and of course, none of that happens in the, with the fenêtre en longueur, which Le Corbusier, Le Corbusier describes as a typical mechanical element of the house. And uh, so, and then, you know, so what, what the game is to, you know, it's kind of pathetic, but the game is by inspection to decide what is public, you know, it's kind of, you could say, totally banal. What is public, what is private, what is semi public, what is. Uh, service. By inspection, the plans are coded with these colors for what is, you know, public, private, semi-public service. And then there are these two routes, the pedestrian route and the vehicular route, that more or less consistently are. So here you see, you know, the movement of the subject through the space. And in this case, there's a living dining kitchen on the ground floor. And these are sort of slim quasi-private sleeping spaces. And when you go upstairs, you know, up this spiral staircase, then in the same corner as this one, you find the, the, uh, the next living room. And then, uh, you know, again, ambiguous private spaces that are partly studios and partly sleeping spaces. And this extraordinary um, bathroom, which also collapses so that when the when the uh, thing is opened out and all the sliding elements move back, sliding, folding, and in this case, you know, the bathroom is 
folded up. Then this becomes a kind of public uh, a space, you know, a very ample public space. So there is also this transformability, which I think was one of uh, Van Dersberg's uh, five points. I mean, the fact that this is uh, timber construction is evident, you see, from these floors. And um, as opposed to this one, where, you know, the piloti, uh, you know, there's only one showing between the cross walls, but nonetheless, it's there. And uh, the garage is there, sh shown grey service. This is very ambiguous space. He marks it abri on the plan, which means shelter. But, uh, you know, it's, it was always left very ambiguous in this early moment, you know, raising the houses off the ground as part of the five-point deal, but not entirely clear what to do with the space underneath. <clears throat> and moreover, other kind of uh, quaint things, like, for example, you go down this picturesque path and you enter into this entrance hall and you climb the staircase. But if you are a servant, you carry on around here and go up this little door because there's a separate uh, servant entrance. You know, it's all a little weird to do with middle class, you could say, bourgeois values, including the fact that this is a boudoir uh, of, the, of the madame and then the master bedroom and two other bedrooms. And, uh, and a, a bathroom in the corner that serves all these bedrooms you can enter from both sides. So that's gray, the whole thing, plus this storage. And the staircase is treated as a kind of public space, although it's, of course, m very minimal. I mean, you, you can imagine the kind of contradictions that are sort of unavoidable. But when you uh, come up, then the whole of this L, which is dining, living, dining, uh, and, this, and here is the kitchen, which can also be accessed, uh, built on top of the bathroom. And then this is a double height space. This is the void over the double height space. And this staircase goes up to this library, which opens out to the terrace. So the L here, you know, is answered by the inverted L on the other side. And the double height volume links the elevated terrace at library level and the, uh, how am I doing? Not very well, I think. But anyway. and. Uh, so the idea then of the volume is very different. And this is actually a sort of retrospective uh, color uh, perspective by, by uh, Riefeldt uh, of what was the original scheme, which included painting the wooden floorboards different uh, neoplastic colors, etc. cetera. <coughs> and uh, this doesn't have that kind of color. It does use color, but um, it doesn't use that kind of color, so you already have. And then this space here, which is a double height space, and oh yeah, OK. And this date, also he, that's also very fascinating, because he's influenced by Adolf Loos, basically, at this date. In fact, the magazine of Spinovo, published in 1920, um, Adolf Loos's Ornament and Crime, retranslation, because it's already been translated into French. And it's clear that the degree zero of the white architecture uh, of the five points is like the equally kind of degree zero as, as um, Loess's, um, you know, like the Steiner Villa of Loess, you know. Uh, and <clears throat> so that they have in common. And the other is the, the paradoxical anti-total work of art attitude of Loos. I mean, the, from that point of view, the whole neoplastic project is to create another kind of total work of art where everything is pinwheeling about everything. Whereas in this, in this work, there is a kind of break between the, oh, above all, of course, it's got to do with the furniture and the carpets, because this is you know, furniture and carpets bought by the clients and this is what Loos's ethical argument is, that um, uh, architects have the right to design built-in furniture. But as far as all movables, I mean, he, here he distinguishes between, in French, meubler furniture and immeubler apartments, movables and immovables. 
you know, and it distinguishes at a kind of uh, ontological level between, um, you know, furniture that can be bought to, by the clients according to their taste, not designed by the architect, thereby breaking the kind of uh, oppressive magic of a total work of art, you know. And this is what you find in this work. And yet, at the same time, there is um, there's an assertion of the mechanical, you know, so that the radiators are exposed, and the, of course, the, it's of the same genre as the the fenêtre en longueur and and uh, the uh, mechanical elements of the house. Whereas this game, where you have these slots of space and this round. You know, element that's on the axis of the double height space is, you know, inherently has a kind of vestigial classical aspect. And so the the although the five points set themselves up as um, as uh, you know a kind of quasi technical prescription, there is loaded into the five points ideological um, preferences. And, and among these preferences, of course, goes the double height space, which has two typological origins. One is uh, the use of double height space in arts and crafts houses, you know, particularly in England, uh, often operating together with the stair hall and the minstrel's gallery. And there's something, I think, there's a trace of that in this relationship of this, you know, gallery overlooking the double height space. And the, um, the other thing is the artist's studio as double height space. So the, these two things are lying there in the... So, and then there is, of course, this categoric opposition between the corner casement windows and the, the sliding and actually small casements of the fenêtre en longueur. And, uh, and then, of course, the terrace in the the roof garden in the case of the Maison Cook, the, the pathos of this space and the you know, kind of totally crazy servant's entrance at the back, you know? I mean, crazy by, I don't know, crazy by today's standards, could we say, you know? And, uh, and then, you know, uh, the, the analysis gets into, you know, what are the low-bearing walls in the case of this timber framed, uh, um, you know, framed up load bearing walls in case of this timber framed Riefeld Schroeder house versus the, uh, the fact that these are two massive, uh, sorry, two massive uh, uh, cross walls. And then there is this wall which coincides with the freestanding column. The span is going across that, of course. And then as part of the whole business of expression suppression the here there's also suppression in that um, you know that this is not the maison cook but it's the same technology reinforced concrete uh, frame construction uh, concrete block infill rendered over this is the Ma villa gosh of 1927 and this is the fundamental game of course even reinforcing putting the reinforcement inside hollow concrete blo block and that, this little diagram is a diagram of the five points, really. The piloti, the uh, free facade, the free plan. Uh, well, you can't show it very well here. The fenêtre en longueur and the roof garden, which is seen by him as compensating for having covered over the ground with the house in the first place. Um, and then what is fascinating is that these colors, of course, this is actually a counter composition made around 1924 by Van Dersberg van Eastern, where, where you know, the technology is still the uh, hypothetical technology of the framed house as in the Rietveld Schroeder house. But these, um, but the game is, of course, to, to well, through the use of the colored planes, suggest so a kind of proliferation of, of planes where, where, you, where you look closely, you know, there are pierced windows, but in fact, like here, for example, but in fact, the, this planar articulation suggests, you know, <coughs> a pinwheeling of planes. And the colors then are part of that pinwheeling, pinwheeling game. Whereas here, you know, the colors are being used in a more painterly fashion to 
make planes uh, recede or advance, you know, spatially. The red ochre advancing somewhat, the blue, the sky blue receding somewhat, and, uh, sorry, and brings us, and that brings me, you know, full circle back to this map <coughs> and this uh, tension <coughs> between uh, references to folklore and, and to industry and to the classic, so that when you, you go back here, I'm looking for this image, which I, yeah, you see this image, then the folklore is in this kilim on the floor, industry is the radiator and the fenêtre en longueur, and culture, quote unquote, classic, is in the, in the architecture itself, you know, and uh, so in terms of values, you know, the, this, this question of, of trying to reconcile conflicting values is, you know, inherent in the, the 1925 map of the 1925 Voyage d'Orient and is uh, present, of course, in the exposed radiators, the, the sliding casement windows in steel, even bent wood to some extent, typewriter, of course. Um, and this, again, you know, is, this is actually Lose's, uh, uh, one of Lose's villas, you know, that is, uh, you know, referred to. And this, of course, is a Mondrian painting and the red-blue chair of Rietveld, you know, showing uh, these antecedents, therefore trying to argue that the, that the connotations of the, uh, the, way the, uh, the way the two houses are detailed allude to totally different value systems, so that this uh, 1920 famous painting by Le Corbusier, um, uh, still life with a pile of plates, uh, you know, this being the pile of plates, but then guitar, of course, and then uh, this ambiguous form, which is either a book or, or an architectural profile, and this bottle and the clay pipes and so on, and bottles. I mean, it's taking actually the Café uh, environment of the Cubis and uh, kind of rationalizing the Cubist uh, representation of this Café Terrasse. Café Terrasse building, having in itself, you know, the value of uh, urban bo bohemian life and uh, therefore of a kind of urban bohemian culture. But one of, the, one of the fascinating things about the, the aux enfants, le Corbusier, creation of purist um, aesthetic, which comes with their 1918 first purist exhibition in Paris, and then their, uh, their manifesto, Après le Cubism, and, um, and their 1920 manifesto, Le Purism, I mean, what is contained in both is that it is, of course, about painting and some kind of normative, iconic aesthetic of painting, because it's clear that this is uh, that this is it's meant to be an icon, you know. And um, as you know, the Mondrian, all of Mondrian's canvases are meant to be icons also, and um, uh, and you see, this is actually. Uh, a study by Bernard Hoseley of the, of the implicit layering of the space inside this painting, and by the same figure, the implicit layering of the space inside the Villa Gauche. And here, you know, from a 1925, uh, 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 yes, essay from Exposition des Arts Decoratifs, uh, where, you know, the, the standard object, the industrially produced standard object, like industrially produced glassware, uh, standard musical instruments, um, uh, clay pipes, still then, uh, and uh, bottles and glasses and so on, you know, produced by uh, industry. Not really um, art objects, but uh, objet, in a sense, objet trouvé, found objects, you know, found as the kind of spontaneous production 
of an industrial civilization. You know. And that is what is, uh, is the value implicit in this work, I think, and that, uh, and that brings me, what, to the end of the whole damn thing. And, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, now they've vanished, so I can just indulge for a few more minutes. You know, I, here's you know, the comparison of uh, Alto's 1937 pavilion to um, Le Corbusier's pavilion de Tom de Vaux, or, you know, um, well, I'm not going to go into it all, because it's just, it's altogether too much, right? But, and then, of course, the Tugendhout house versus the, um, the Villa Maria, uh, well, the Tugendhout is 1930, the Villa Maria is 39, and the book goes on like that. I, I, I mean, I, you know, obviously, I, you know, I've been talking more than an hour, I think, so in order not to drive everybody nuts, I think we should have a discussion. All right, thanks. Are we going to sit here? What's happening exactly? Uh, right. Anyway. Uh, yes, go on. I feel like sitting down, actually, after that. Thanks very much, Ken. Okay. Um, yeah, right. It's a special honor to be able to share this stage with you. Uh, Ken was my doctoral advisor, and I think as uh, my colleague Michael Schwarting uh, noted before, he, uh, for those of you who don't know, Kenneth Frampton has been a teacher and a mentor to multiple generations of faculty and students in this room, so it's a real honor uh, Thank you. to have you here. Um, and a pleasure, too. And thank you very much for the presentation. Um, this is a, a, a fantastic book. And it's a very useful book for me, uh, working with my students, particularly uh, my beginning students, because it, it, it's a book that furnishes them with a set of concepts um, and categories that they can use in analyzing buildings on a comparative basis. Um, and it does so in an, in an accessible way. Um, the, um, the categories that you use include type and context. Um, the second one. Well, the public, private. Public, private, mm -hmm. service. Um, semi-public. Mm -hmm. Sorry, and se semi-public. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Incredibly useful. Um, but then when, you know, we, we discussed it in class, and we, we also, when you applied it, I'm sure you also struggled with the limits of these terms at the mm. same time. For example, um, when you talk about service spaces, you, you, you um, in one place in passing, you, uh, uh, um, you mention a kitchen as an example of a, of a service space. Mm. And yet, I was very happy to see that in, the, in your treatment of the, uh, the Schroeder House mm. in Utrecht, that actually the kitchen is classified there as a public space. Right, yes. yes. So could you maybe talk about your own yeah, struggles right. in, yeah, in terms right. of using these mm. terms mm. and both their, mm. their usefulness and their limitations? Yeah, right. You know, it also has a very interesting historical um, you know, sort of underpinning to all of that, because there's a great book by Barbara Miller Lane on German architecture. I forget the, the, the well, it's really G German architecture in the interwar period mainly. And um, she points out something that the German term Wohnkucke, which is like you know obviously living kitchen, mm -hmm. right? And she also points out that that was the peasant peasant norm, you know, the the Wohn living kitchen was part of peasant houses. And then, you know, you have, and actually, by the way, it's really worth reading again, uh, Gideon's Mechanization Takes Command, which has in it a section where she, he traces, you know, the evolution of the ergonomic kitchen, you know, from Catherine Beecher Stowe, the labor-saving kitchen, in fact, up to, well, up to the present, in a way. And it, it's fascinating that Actually, I was just writing about her indirectly, that the uh, Austrian um, 
committed socialist architect, Greta Schutterle-Hotzky, who would work after 1925 with Ernst May in Frankfurt <coughs> for five years, you know, between 25 and 30, when Ernst May would go to the Soviet Union because the climate in Germany was already going towards the right, I suppose. And, uh, and she went, she followed him to the Soviet Union. And she worked on the most, you know, her name is attached to the so-called Frankfurter Kuka, mm -hmm. which is this ergonomic uh, kitchen like a laboratory, you know, very, very, very organized but very narrow space that is in fact cut off from the living volume of the lower, of the low cost housing, in most instances, the low cost housing that uh, Mai produced in Frankfurt in that five year period, a very large amount, in fact. You know, um, she worked on the housing also, not just on the kitchen, but the kitchen is always like that. It's always this kitchen, and um, and there, you know, you you have historically the whole issue in a way, you know, of the yeah. And it's very interesting that it's American. The idea of the labor-saving uh, mm -hmm. kitchen. Of course, by now, you know, we, uh, you know. The whole thing has evolved. So uh, there are labor-saving kitchens, which are also living kitchens. So that you know, uh, the the tension between these two things doesn't arise anymore. But uh, you know, you can see how the, the the point you've just raised also has its kind of historical, um, you know, ideological underpinning. Mm. Yeah. When is a kitchen? service and when is it not? You know, yeah, because uh, I think, uh, you know. I, I mean, my impression is that, um, I mean, at least in the United States, that the, the kitchen tends to be a preeminent social space. I mean, it's where people like to hang out nowadays, right, right, it seems. Yes, yes. Um, but, I, you know, but, yeah, you know, ahead, but you know, its plan form is not then the super, you know, because the, the ergonomic kitchen is like, you know, it's conceived at some extreme point as though it is like uh, working out a time motion study for somebody on a lathe in a factory mm -hmm. that is treated, the, the operation is treated with it in the same way, mm -hmm. you know? And the, and the woman, since one always assumes it is the woman in this case, is isolated from the family in that ergonomic space in this housing. Mm -hmm. you know? Now I think all of that's passed, I think you could say, sort of. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I, and the, why I use the word sort of is that, you know, you never know quite. But well, we don't build housing anymore anyway, so uh, in that sense, not really. Mm -hmm. So we, don't, we haven't seen, you know, what we would produce under different conditions. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have I have one other question, and then I want to and then I want to open it up for discussion. It, and it's actually a follow up to a question that was raised uh, about a year ago at the Center for Architecture when you when you first um, launched this book. Uh, someone asked the question: um, Have you been to all the houses yeah. that you actually discussed in the book? And you you offered a, a, an answer that astounded me. You said that you actually haven't seen all the houses, and sometimes that's actually an advantage. Yes. Do you remember? Could you, could you elaborate? Yeah, right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, well, it's a mute point whether it's an advantage or not. Um, it's a bit stupid, isn't it? But uh, I should say dwellings, because it's not just houses you talk about in the book, of course. No, it isn't. No, but I have been to quite a lot of them. I mean, I haven't been to all of them. That's a fact, you know. Uh, like these, both the Villa Maria and the Tugendhat House, you know, I've been to that. And I've been to quite a lot. But you say it's sometimes an advantage yeah, not to... Right. What does not that mean? to see the building what the hell does that mean? in real life. What yeah. does that mean? And, yeah. and what do you... Yes, I know. It seems mm -hmm. counterintuitive. It seems... A do bit, you still stand by that? No, I think it's a bit provocative, isn't it? Yeah. I think. I mean, it's not, it's, you know, it's not really, it doesn't make too much sense. 
but no, it, I mean the but only that, thing about it is that, that um, since you're you know since you're using uh, plans and you know drawings and and other data, you know you can get at what what intrinsically the thing is. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's it's quite different from actually directly experiencing it. Of course, you know that's that's that's, that's obvious. But um, but you know if you're just Playing a game with photographs is useless, but if you have, you know, uh, drawings, reliable drawings, uh, and and other data about the uh, about the two works, so you know you can sort of get at it, you know. Um, but I agree, it's it's yeah, it's it's you know you can, it's, it's absurd to say it's an advantage. It's absurd. Provocation. Well, I, I, uh, I mean, I, I uh, yeah, it's provocation. Yeah. What else? <laughs> I mean, uh, we'd love to hear some questions from you all. Yes. So I just wonder if you talk a little bit about why these buildings, why these buildings look as if to the people at the time they just fell out of the sky, that they landed, right? It, it was political reasons, what was going on in the world, right, that caused them to radically depart from most everything that came before. Mm. And I, I think that's sometimes a little bit lost. You know, we seem to have divorced architecture from a lot of what goes on in society and politics. And these are obviously political. These are like punk rockers of their time. You mm. know, they, it was something that had never, I mean, the image of the Rietfeld with its back to the, all the buildings that had been built right. for 100 years before it is a pretty yeah. radical right. statement. And people yeah. must have thought the world was going crazy. So I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, because I think that's something that's a little bit lost to students and myself sometimes. Yeah, right. Yes, um, it's not so easy to get at it, I don't think. I mean, I think that, you know, there is, um, you know, what, what we inherit, I mean, the part, well, part of the virtues, if there are virtues, of this game is that the, that the, you know, otherwise sort of rather difficult divorce between the work of the studio and the work of people who teach, I don't know what, history theory or something of that sort, and is, is kind of very categorically different, you know. So part of the game, I think, is to um, try and bridge that gap, you know. It's not really answering, I know it's not really answering the, the question you made, but, but, um, but there is that, and 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 in the in that you know process, the the the, the effort anyway is directed towards trying to to establish the the tradition the traditions plural of the new you know as we receive it from uh, from this period of history, and you could extend it of course, and and the book book does extend it to recent works. I mean, the Centre Pompidou is in the book, and the um, the Norman Foster um, uh, Cultural Centre in Aix-en-Provence is in the book, etc. You know, and and also at the end uh, two stadia, one by Renzo Piano and one by um, Bonelli Reuse, are compared. You know, they actually they, that also brings up another issue, which is in fact comparing those two buildings is a little problematic because the size of the stadia are very different. You know, so it's not. That, happiest of comparisons in the book. And um, yeah, you know, so, and then that brings up another issue, which is, you know, what buildings do you choose to analyze? What, I mean, why, why can't one do this with any, you know, theoretically, why could you not do this with any building, you know? And, uh, and which is and is not related to your question, you know, because, um, I mean, it's not, unless the building has a kind of, uh, uh, density and in intentionality, which is, which is layered and and rich, you know, it's almost not worth analyzing the building. You know, um, although you could say that there's an a priori, a priori sort of subjective judgment involved as to whether the tutor thinks that this building A is sufficiently dense to compare to this building B, you know, that kind of problematic, uh, uncomfortable aspect of the whole game, you know. It's kind of loaded, you can say the dice are loaded, you know, they are. 
And, uh, and that's still not answering your question because, but, but I, I can only really get at it by saying, you know, that uh, I think that ultimately the tradition of the new is a very complex tradition. I mean, some of that <laughs> is hinted at in the Le Corbusier map where he is, I mean, that's what makes him an uh, absolutely kind of a, a magus, really, in the whole scene because of the, of the complexity of his mind and imagination, you know, to see, to get involved with this idea of a map of Europe in which there are different levels of cultural production coexisting at the same time, you know. And I've never found out exactly, but I think it's Hoffman style, or, or maybe it's Loos. I I, somebody says, you know, men live at the same time in different periods of history, and that's what, you know, that is about in a way, you know, this fact that he recognizes this different... Uh, Wait, can you say that again? Men live at the same time in different periods of history, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, it's a beautiful aphorism, I think. And yeah, I mean, of course, less and less is that the case because of the, for obvious reasons. But, you know, uh, so it's not easy to answer your question to, in a straightforward way. I just think that, you know, the fact that they, well, okay, that appears to, that it came out of out of space. You know, you can say, but if you look at. Um, um, Alto's Villa Maria, you know, is maybe not so uh, foreign, you know, it's using, anyway, it's using traditional material, you know, which uh, in, or material in a traditional way, mostly, combined with other material, of course, you know, but, um, so there's, you know, therefore the legacy is very complex, and, and what, and what I suppose I believe is that uh, that st students should be made aware of the complexity of the legacy. And uh, fashion tends to short circuit all of that. So that one does something because it's, it, it goes along with a certain kind of imagery which is current at the moment. And, uh, and there's no reflection on something that goes deeper, you know, in terms of the predicament of. Uh, of the whole game, you know, you can say that in some sense, architecture is anachronistic. You know, it's an anachronistic, uh, given the domination of techno science and uh, globalized uh, consumerism, for example. You know, architecture is a strange uh, field. Yeah. Yes. Beha. Yeah. Okay. Observation is really for most of our, mostly our students uh, that uh, when Kenneth, uh, kind of in his missive, um, pointed at something, which is he said, one does not go through the game of looking at photographs. Of course, plans and the drawings are important. I think that we go through that a lot of us with our students, and that when we ask them to look at a building or to analyze it that they, uh, they look at a lot of photographs and oftentimes they don't come up with the, the, the information and the concept that's really in the thoughts of the architect. I think so that's a very important point even though Ken kind of uh, uh, said it in a very quick way and I, I think that's very important for us. Um, the, other, well, the question I have is the following. Uh, I know that from being one of your students and also following up what's happening. Uh, you often have, I mean, you almost always have these projects when they're being analyzed, you have students build models of them. Yet in this book, uh, none of the model photographs right, or the right. idea is included. Yeah. Uh, can you please articulate that, uh, about that? You know, there is an exhibition of models that are kind of left over from teaching by me at different times. And most of the models, it will actually the exhibition will open tomorrow in Colombia. It's a funny exhibition. But anyway, mm -hmm. I'm happy about the fact that there are some models there that were made in the course of the course that has the title Studies in Tectonic Culture. And they were made as models that um, were intended to, uh, well, they made, I mean, the, 
The idea is to make a didactic model which reveal, and not a schematic model, nor a realistic model, but a didactic model that reveals the conceptual uh, poetic of construction that's, that's inherent to the work, you know. And, uh, and those mod okay, so there's some of those models, but there is one model that's also in the exhibition because the dean wanted to have whatever model she could lay her hands on. Uh, a model of the Riefau Schroeder House, you know, which has been sitting around in Colombia forever. And obviously, I asked some student, or some students made that, I can't remember anymore, that model as part of a sort of, mm. I don't know, fulfilling a general history course. And it's, it's, a, it's quite a nice model, but it hasn't, but it's completely different from the other models that are being shown in the space, in that it's not really to do with this question of trying to make a didactic model which reveals a certain poetic based on the, the way the work is constructed, although it does show, it does give some information about that as a model, I mean. But, um, yes, I mean, why aren't there any models? Well, I, I mean, any models that, well, there is actually a model that, because when I uh, came to the Le Corbusier Pavillon de Tom Nouveau, which I used one of those models, which is a model of the structure of the Pavillon de Tom Nouveau, as, um, as a kind of uh, uh, exemplifying the reality of that pavilion at the time that it was made, you know. Of course, it doesn't exist anymore, did, didn't almost immediately after the exhibition closed. <coughs> so, um, I don't know how to answer the question, really. I, I, I tried to use documentary material which was available and, what, and which was produced at the time in relation to the, uh, the, the stuff, the, 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 the thing under consideration. And, of course, laid on top of that is an analysis of plans, which are drawings made by students, you know, as part of the overall exercise, um, which is not made at the time that the buildings were made. But there aren't models, it's true. I don't really... I'm not sure what to do with the models in that particular exercise, actually. I know what I was trying to do with the models for the tectonic thing. Um, Actually, you, you, were, you alluded to something which I have recently um, had to come to terms with, which is that uh, Thames and Hudson, the publisher of Modern Architectural History, wants to expand it to include the non-Eurocentric world. Mm. And, um, well, recently I've become very interested in architects in Bangladesh, you know, that are very sophisticated architects. I mean, not so many, but enough to make a, make one take notice, you know. And uh, it's a place that you, well, it's a very difficult place. It, it, it's a, you know, it's a place that depends on the monsoon and suffers from the monsoon and, and from, from continual flooding, of course, you know. Um, and it's also, of course, you know, it suffers from the usual thing of, of a capital city, which is absolutely impossible, you know, because of the number of people in it, the number of automobiles and so on. But it's still, you know, it's really, part of, really remarkable the, the level of work that's being done by, of course, for a certain class, you know, no escaping it, and mostly. <coughs> and, um, and also by certain architects that also belong to this class, you know. That also can't be escaped either, because clearly it's, you know, it's a profession that is always anchored in. I mean, there are, in, in the historic history, of course, there are moments like this figure that I mentioned, Shuzelihotsky, you know, who comes from a bourgeois background but works her entire life uh, for, for socialist, socialist state. And, uh, you know, but, but in the main, of course, it is, you know, it's a class. Uh, the profession is a class and it works for a certain class, you know. It's inescapable, you know, reality, I think. With, with these exceptions that have occurred at different times, you know, with socialist governments or with welfare state governments. But, 
We're rather removed from that. Mm -hmm. Judy, go ahead. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, that's not like you How am at I all. surprised, right? <laughs> well, no, I mean, I'm, I'm super, super intrigued with the complexity of the Corbusier map. Oh, yeah. And the introduction of, uh, uh, well, the folklore. Yeah. The folklore is a most curious situation because the folklore means, if I understand what you're using it as, the things that are brought into these. Uh, modern worlds yeah, right, right. by the owner, let's say. Or does Corbusier presume that these buildings are built to display, quote unquote, the folklore? Because, for instance, at the Villa Garche, that amazing image of the interior of this modern machine with all of that heavy wood, Spanish-like furniture seems in contradiction. In, in the Maison Cook, you mean? No, no, I'm oh. talking about Maison oh, the Villa And also Garche. Garche when they occupied. Yeah, yes, yes. Mm. and I'm just wondering, um, w did Corbu, in, I mean, you, is this in his complex mind an intentional thing that he wanted to see the introduction of folklore? Yeah, well, I think it's conne it connects to Adolf Loos. I think that it was a Loosian uh, idea, you know, a Loosian kind of ethical, ethical idea that against the idea of the total work of art, you know, and therefore, you know, the sunny his use of the sunny chair and uh, industrial light fittings and uh, glassware, you know, industrially produced, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. As it appears, there's this great shot uh, inside the dining room of uh, La, La Roche, you know, which shows both the, the purest painting and then on the High up, there's a goldfish bowl, and there's a kind of cabinet with rolling uh, shutters, and an industrial lamp, and a, a you know, B, B, B12 or B14, whatever, this, this sunny armchair, you know. So he's, he is selecting those industrially produced pieces, which his clients don't do, but he's also selecting them, you know, in a way to break, well, it's all very paradoxical in a way because it's like breaking the total work of art thing and also uh, returning, you know, it's sort of returning to it. This idea of equipment, you know, which he, 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 he and all of it preoccupies him against the 1935 L'Exposition des Arts Décoratifs, you know. And, um, and two things happen, you know, in uh, in 929, he finishes the Villa Savoie, and in that sense, that's the last purist villa. That's a, also a fact that when the neo Corbusian discourse starts in the States, you know, it, the, the five architects and et cetera, you know, don't follow him because, of the, you know, he breaks decisively his uh, position. You know, he abandons the purism. And, and uh, the Villa Era Suris is you know using vernacular, it, you know, un, uh, undressed timber, um, rubble stone walling, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you know, and so his whole uh, uh, sort of discourse becomes more complicated. But I think when, you know, when the you, you rightly pointed out when the Stein family move into the Garsh, they um, you know they have this heavy furniture and they do have Oriental carpets, but he. You know, they just put in their stuff, you know. And I think, you know, at that point, he, at that moment, he, he has this kind of Lothian idea that, that people should just be free to put in what the hell they want, you know. Um, and then, you know, at some point he breaks from the purist position. And, um, and he, you know, it's a fundamental change. I mean, one of the most beautiful buildings, I think, made along these lines is the 1935 Weekend House in San Clou, where, you know, he combines uh, rubble stone walling, um, earth, um, uh, shell concrete vaults, um, uh, white painted brickwork, uh, plywood ceilings, and uh, plate glass and steel frames, and glass bricks. They're all combined in the, so he's mixing now, you know, uh, 
archaic, um, you know, um, European, you know, rubblestone <coughs> European masonry technique with, you know, shell concrete with uh, plate glass, steel frame. Uh, you know, he's do, he's putting it all together, you know, in this kind of little mythic house, which no longer exists, unfortunately. And uh, but. Yeah, he's a subtle old monster, no doubt about it. Yeah. Uh, yes, back there. Hi. Um, I wrote my question down. Um, so based on the book, modern architecture is analyzed um, within this trichotomy of the classic, the vernacular, and the technological. Um, I'm curious to know how did you um, decide on these uh, three keywords? And also, um, can, is it appropriate to analyze um, contemporary and postmodern, post postmodern um, architecture within that framework, within that trinity? Great question. Yeah, it's a good question. Yes. I don't know how to answer it. Uh, I mean, I used it because he uses it, first of all. Who's he? Corbusier. I see. In the map, you know. And, um, and because he's aware of it, you know, because you can see from the detailing that there is this going on in his brain, you know, the, the um, culture in the sense of humanist, classical, um, harmonic ideas going back to the Greek, I suppose. And, but also going, you know, let's say for that matter, to um, uh, the vernacular architecture of the Mediterranean. Vaulted vernacular architecture of the Mediterranean. And um, and that, yeah, and vernacular, well, uh, I mean, that's, there's certain still a validity, I think, to, I mean, in a way, these things, but anyway, but it's clear that vernacular and technology. Um, or let's put it this way, uh, archaic, relatively speaking, archaic ways of building and uh, very sophisticated uh, ways of building which are dependent upon industrial production and industrial methods coexist and have coexisted for a long time and still, I think, basically coexist. And um, so they, they are there as an availability, really. You know, something that is kind of available, depending, of course, on other factors that Im impinge on the real situation. But um, you can say vernacular is more problematic, and probably you, you have to confess that sort of vernacular in the pure sense of vernacular no longer exists, you know, mm -hmm. that um, you don't have a kind of uh, rooted instinctual vernacular. Pretty, I mean, there are obviously... Uh, you know, um, isolated <coughs> parts of the world where the vernacular still exists uh, under enormous pressure. Uh, and that pressure was already, he was already aware of this pressure in 1925 when in the um, um, La Decorative d'Aujourd'hui, Decorative Arts Today, he remarks on the fact that cheap tin production from Western countries is penetrating into the Balkans and destroying the basic vernacular ceramic culture of the Balkans. This is 19, you know, in the early half, half part of the 20s. He's very aware that that, that is what is going on, you know. So, um, so then, you know, the vernacular in that sense is um, even more and more, um, yes, it's more and more more and more eroded in a way, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Yes. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'm just curious, uh, what was your... Um... Hi. Um, I'm just curious, what was your exact uh, move after you graduated from, from your education? And fast forwarding to today's day and age, what kind of advice would you tell the oh, next generation of architects? Great question. The question. Yeah. Actually, I have a student who just went to Mexico City 
I think it's the best thing that ever happened to him, you know. Um, I mean, judging from a recent letter I received, I mean, it's, it's absolutely extraordinary. He's been there about three weeks. He worked on a Dada exhibition that was put up in the Louis Barragan house, you know. Very simple exhibition, but with beautiful uh, kind of quasi-surrealist furniture pieces and this Dada mm -hmm. exhibition around the walls. And he, he's working for a Mexican woman architect. And there is a kind of, th a moment I think is a lot of energy in Mexico City with a lot of young people that have, <coughs> you know, have clients and uh, it's, a, it's a good moment, you know. And uh, so there is, uh, there is this possibility of making a break for it, you know. Uh, I mean, you know, but also from a point of view of experience, because if you know you're relatively young, as he is, and and you know probably you, etc. You know, you it's a moment in your life where you could go somewhere where there is more a different kind of energy. You know, and in my case, I um, and I did crazy things like when I stopped, when I finished, when I graduated, I went to the British Army because I was still. Conscription. That was a very stupid thing to do. I really wish I'd gone to France, forgot about it, um, gone illegally to France and stayed in France and forget about it. You know, but I think it would have been much better for my own development to have made that move than to spend two years in the stupid British army. You know? And when I got out of that, I went to Israel. And, and the one virtue of going to Israel was that the technology at that time was very... Uh, you know, very simple, concrete block, concrete frame, you know, climatic conditions do not, you know, n not a lot of problem with water penetration and rain. You know, I found that incredibly liberating and uh, uh, it gave me, you know, I got a lot out of one year in that country, you know. Um, I don't know, you know, there's no, uh, there's no recipe. So you're saying travel? Well, I think it's good to do that, yes. You know, particularly mm -hmm. once you have responsibilities, you're unlikely to do that, you know, mm -hmm. so to speak. And uh, personal responsibilities, I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is that it? We've yes. done it? Okay. Thank you so much, Ken. Yeah.